happens now. Oh, yes, people have started to come in. Ah, gotcha. There's 11 so far. Absolutely. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. We're just going to sit here and allow people to join up before we get started. But thanks for coming in. Um, um, and we'll, yeah, we'll get cracking in probably about 60 seconds, something like that. Okay, well, let's make a, a start. I'm sure there'll be more and more coming in in the next few minutes, but you know, it's not essential that you hear every single word of this presentation. Um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Mark Huntington. I'm from A Star Future uh, here in the UK. Uh, we help lots and lots of British students every year to go and study abroad all around the world, um, not just in the US. Uh, we're very active in Europe as well. Um, but the, the opportunities that we do work with in the US are ones that I would describe as perhaps a little bit more realistic uh, in terms of their accessibility, affordability, and so on. So the real focus in this afternoon session is not really to go on and on about those elements of studying in the US, which will only ever apply to a very small handful of people, um, you know, around sporting scholarships or getting into an Ivy League or something like that. Uh, we want to present um, a very relatively affordable, sensible way of getting into US higher education. And with that in mind, we've got Yella Drapi here from, uh, well, he's the European representative of Green River uh, College, and he's going to tell you an awful lot more about them and about who he is and why it is he's the, uh, the expert on today's talk in a moment. Um, but what I'd like him to do is to deliver a presentation, which will probably last about 20 minutes, something like that. And then we'll use the majority of the time we have to answer any questions that you might uh, want to ask. Now, when it comes to asking questions, hopefully you can see if you roll the cursor around on Zoom that there is a Q&A feature at the bottom. Um, you can contact us through there or through chat. We prefer it if you're going to ask an actual question that it comes into the Q&A because then I can see it and moderate it a little bit more easily. If you've got general comments you want to make to panelists or other participants, the chat function is there. Um, hopefully you can already see there's a couple of things in there. Uh, those are just links that Yella has already put up, which will be to interesting information that um, you could refer to in your own time. But for now, I think what I'll do is I will hand over to Yella. I'm gonna load up his presentation while he uh, introduces himself to you briefly, okay? Thank you very much, Mark. Well, hello everyone. My name is Yella Draper. Um, I'm originally from the Netherlands, where I, uh, after I graduated high school, I uh, moved to the US for college. I went to Green River College myself as a student. This is about six, seven years ago. Um, after Green River, I transferred to Southern California and I uh, did another year of school over there before returning back to the Netherlands. Um, as an alumni, I was asked several times to assist at you know actual fairs instead of the online ones. Um, to you know explain a little bit about what it's like to study in the us as a as a, a dutch citizen in that case um and later on they asked me to represent them more in, uh, in europe and that's how i got the position uh to represent green river both from a sales perspective but also from a, an alumni perspective and, and i hope i can answer all the questions you guys might have i hope everybody can see my presentation um first of all Seattle, that's the city where we're next to. We're about 40 minutes south of Seattle in a city called Auburn. Um, it's a beautiful green environment. You'll be able to see that on the next slide where uh, this is a, an image of our campus. Um, at the bottom of the screen, there's a, a forest, which is just part of the campus property um, where students can relax. And it's, it's a natural, uh, we're about 40 minutes away from a, a national park. Uh, Mount Rainier is a, a view from our campus, so it's a, it's a beautiful area if you're into the outdoor living experience. If you see some, sorry, I don't have the presentation in front of me here. Mark is clicking through the I, presentation for me. Sorry, is that wrong? No, that was correct. That was correct. I just had the, the order of the slides in my head incorrectly. 
Um, there's just a couple of reasons for you to choose Green River. The, I think personally the most important one is the, the transfer programs that we offer. On top of that, on-campus housing is very quite rare in the US. Uh, we used to be a community college, uh, therefore lower cost, smaller class sizes, which is uh, better for your personal experience and probably you be getting higher grades as you have more personal interactions with your students and professors. And also it's close to the bigger city if you wanna go explore for the weekend. Go ahead, Mark. Here we have some photos of the campus, so you have a, a little bit of an idea what it would look like. This is our library, technology center. The science lab has several uh, labs in the, in the center itself, so there's always room for students to, you know, on top of the classes, do their own personal experiments. Just some more information. As you can see, most of our campus photos are very green. That's why, because we're located in a, in a forest. The student union, a new building, opened up a couple of years ago for all of our students to hang out. It's not just the cafeteria, but it's more of a communal space where students hang out and relax after work uh, or after their classes. That's also where our recreational center is located. Uh, we have a gym for students to use, indoor dance classes, uh, boxing classes, all for the students to participate. Uh, and have their personal workout as well and stay fit during their time at Green River. The school is about a total of about 10,000 students at the moment, um, of which almost 20% or 15% roughly would be international from 63 different nationalities. Therefore, it's a very diverse school. We have many students from Asia, but also from most European countries and in the Middle East, several students as well. Um, there are several options for you. You can live on campus or with a host family, regardless of your personal, uh, you know, personal uh, preference. Excuse me for that. Um, and also, the location is just extremely beautiful. In the chat box, I've already uploaded a link of our virtual tour, where after the presentation, you might be able to take a look and you know walk around campus like you're actually there and get a better uh, idea of what it would be like to be a student over there final photos of our campus and this is basically our programs that we offer um the biggest one then the the most important one i'd say is our university transfer program meaning you'll be doing two years with us and then you transfer to another university whether that's in the us or somewhere else um more about that later to finalize your final two years of your bachelor's degree we also have an intensive english program and a high school completion program but that doesn't really apply uh to uk citizens that's mostly for our asian market on top of that, there are several degrees and certificates, and we have a specialized gap year program for uh, you know, students that just want to take a year off and have a, a unique experience in the United States, but more about that a little bit later. Of our transfer program, we have uh, transferred students to top universities all over the world. As you can see, there's a brief list like UCLA, uh, Brown University, uh, Georgia Tech and Columbia Stanford. Um, and on top of that, we have university transfer pathways, meaning that to some universities, we can guarantee acceptance um, where some other schools might not have that opportunity to offer. For example, this is one of our uh, former Dutch students. Um, he started off at Green River not really knowing what he wanted to study. Eventually he graduated and went off to Oxford for his master's degree and is now currently studying uh, ideal for his PhD. So he really went the long run, whereas uh, a lot of students or people think that starting off at a community college is a lesser thing than starting off at university. I think Remco is the best example that that's not the case. Uh, you can really excel from any point of view or any starting point, actually. The next story is, for example, Goresh. He's a UK citizen. Um, he started off at Green River. Um, after he graduated from Green River, he moved to the Netherlands to one of our partner universities, which is University College Roosevelt, uh, UCR. And he uh, finished that, he completed his degree two years ago, I believe. Uh, so that's another pathway that was an opportunity. And, and like Goresh, we have many more uh, to represent David, American University, and several others. Uh, here you have a brief overview of the degrees and certificates, mostly our associate's degree, associate's in arts, science and business. And there underneath you see several um, certificates. On top of that, we offer some bachelors. Uh, they're mostly in the software development industry, 
aeronautical sciences or natural resource management. It's only eight bachelors in total that we offer. Um, it's not our biggest thing yet, but we felt recently started to offer those, I think two or three years ago. So it's uh, still expanding. The gap year, this is uh, something I personally did. Um, on the top right screen of the, the surfer guy, that's also me, but seven years ago. Um, we have several options. First of all, our Green River gap year, the traditional version. That means you can study at Green River as an international student for three, six, or nine months, depending on how long you want to be abroad for, your budget, and other um, things taken in mind. We also have the option to do several experiences within the same year. So that would be the Green River to California gap year. You start off at Green River College for three months, and then during winter, you move to Southern California for the second half of your gap year experience. This could be all to Hawaii as well. And as a final option, you start off at Green River for three months. During winter time, you go to the Australian and New Zealand summer. You study there for three months, and then in spring, you come back to Green River to finalize your full year as a, as a gap year experience. The services that we offer for our students are very diverse. Uh, one of the things is, for example, our housing department. We arrange that in-house, so there's a lot of flexibility for our students. Our admissions team, here you see our director of advising, Adam, he'll sit down, or one of his advisors from the team will sit down with you to schedule all the classes that might be the best fit for your you know, personal preferences. We arrange university transfer fairs, as you can see on the next slide. It's a bit further on. <laughs> Two more slides down the road. Uh, foundation for Success, it's, it's part of the, um, you know, the transfer fair is part of the uh, Foundation of Success. We want students, you know, they move to a different country. What is it that makes you successful in university industry, uh, American university industry? Um, so there are several classes that will, will assist you with that, helping your, picking your classes. And then of course, the fair um, to meet other schools and, and, and maybe help you make a decision on where you wanna, you know, graduate from. Go ahead. Sorry. No worries. Our housing options at Green River. We have an on-campus housing facility uh, or host families, depending on your personal preference. Again, some students really want that cultural experience and others want to have the more of a student life experience, which is most of the time on campus. A fairly unique thing about Green River, we have affordable one bedroom apartment. Uh, uh, bedrooms. So you'll have your private bedroom, which is fairly unique in the US, especially on campus. Um, you'll be sharing the, you know, the common areas like the living room and the kitchen with three other students. So there's a total of four students in each apartment and you have two bathrooms as well. So therefore it is a, a quite luxurious student housing accommodation uh, and very affordable if you compare it to a lot of other places in the US. Once you arrive at Green River, first we do have your orientation week, which is the, the week where you meet most of your new friends, I would call them. Uh, but this also assists you with registration for classes. You'll meet your advisors, sit down for your academic plan, and uh, just have a really fun week to explore the US. Some photos on the next slide will show some of the activities. It's bonfires, it's you know trip to Seattle, uh, that kind of stuff to meet other students. I said before Green River would be a very affordable option. Here you have a, a brief breakdown of the cost. Our tuition is about 10,000 US dollars per academic year, including living expenses, which is housing, food, and other things as well. The total would be about 21,000 US dollars per year. Um, this basically includes all the, the costs that you would uh, you know, encounter except for your flight back and forth to the UK and visa costs. So it's a very affordable option within the US. You can see that on the next slide. The date is a little bit outdated, but to be honest, the tuition fee rates haven't changed much for the other schools. Uh, and this gives you an idea of how low our tuition fee is. Whereas if you transfer after two years and you go to University of Washington, for example, after four years, you'll still have the same degree. It will still say bachelor from University of Washington, only you've saved about $50,000 during those two years that you were there. If there's any questions, I'll get back to you guys in a minute, but I wanna show you some photos of my time while being in the US. This might give a little bit of a better explanation. Again, I went from Green River where I was skiing in October 
to Southern California where I was well, surfing in February. I personally wanted to have that cultural experience. So in the, in the top middle photo, you see myself. This was actually on the day I arrived in the US. My host family, how tired I was, I don't remember. But they took me to a baseball game right away. And that was, of course, the most American experience I could have. And that was, you know, a very unique moment up to this day. Um, on the top right corner and the top left corner, you see the, the friends I made. And we went on hikes on Mount Rainier. We went to lakes, kayaking, all these uh, outdoor activities. And at the bottom photos, these are all the trips I made. Barbecue with my friends at my place. We went to Seattle as a group. Uh, horse races, that kind of stuff as a as a fun group and, and then I'm still in touch with most of those those people you see on the photos. My host family decided to take in more students. So on the top left photo you see a Danish student on the left with a Chinese student, then my host mom, me, an Indonesian student and my host dad. So it was a very cultural mixed family which I personally thought was great. I learned not only the American culture but also more about the Chinese and Indonesian and Danish culture even though the, that one is quite similar to the Dutch one. Uh, again, skiing, uh, great ski opportunities at, in Green River area next to the city. So that was one of the pluses. Um, another fun thing, if you go back one, Sorry. Slide, Mark. no worries. You see me in a, well, you see me welding. Um, I started off as a, a general studies or liberal arts, however you want to call it, but I'll get back to you guys on that a little bit later. Uh, and one of the classes I really wanted to try was welding. Uh, I've never used it ever since, but it was a very fun experience um, and, and something totally different than what I've always done. And therefore, uh, Green River gave me that opportunity and that possibility. And that, that's what made it such a great time for me. And of course, the view from Green River. This is, not, this is just 20 minutes away from Green River, this view. Uh, it's not too bad. The, the area is amazing and beautiful. So I would definitely recommend whether it's not for university, whether it's not for Green River College, go check out the Pacific Northwest as it's, uh, it's absolutely stunning. Okay, thank you very much, Yala. That gives us um, a good sense as to who Green River is and what it's all about to go and study at Green River College. Um, what I'd like to do now is just, I want to come back to a couple of things that, that Yala touched upon um, with regards to the educational offer at Green River College. Um, because clearly what we're trying to do today is to give you some accessible routes into the US. We'll come on to the money side of things in a moment. Um, but really, the first thing I want to say is, if this is the first time you're really seriously engaging with the idea of going to study in the USA, um, perhaps you'll not be aware of exactly what it means to go to university there. In one of the sign up, well, one of the questions we asked when we asked you to sign up to this session was what you wanted to study when you got to university. But we primarily ask that because in the UK, it's such a big deal. You know, if you don't know what you want to study, it's kind of, you can't really go anywhere. In the United States, it's very, very different. It's actually quite common to go to university without a clue what you want to do when you get there or to try new things like welding. I wasn't aware of that one uh, as part of your degree because the US system pretty much enables people to study a whole wide range of different subjects, six, seven, eight in the first year. There will be some core requirements, things probably around English and mathematics and so on, but you will have a lot of freedom to study all sorts of things that you've never thought about before, the things that you ultimately think you want to go on and do later, but it will be a mix. It won't all be about one subject or the other. That specialization really starts to happen a bit later in an American bachelor's degree. So when Yellow was talking about this two plus two process, um, the two years at the beginning, the two years you do at Green River College are the two more general years. And then when you go on to the two years in the transfer school, uh, the university that you end up at later, that really would be where you do specialize. So for the vast majority, if you wanted to do business, for example, you would start off doing a whole range of different courses, but after a couple of years, you would end up studying and focusing mostly on business. The downside of this approach comes if you are looking to study in a particular profession. So for those of you who are interested in things like law or medicine, this, the US in general, you need to think twice about, I would suggest. Um, law schools and medical schools in the US are graduate schools, meaning you don't go there after two years or you go there after four years. Um, so, you know, straight out of school, 
going to university in the US is not going to be about going to law school or medical school, but there are pathways you could go on that would lead you in that direction. Uh, they are expensive, particularly by the time you get to law or medical school. Um, and also you have to think about whether you'll be allowed to stay on and work there after you graduate. But there, there are a lot more elements to that. It's a bit more complicated than just signing up for a course that leads in and points in that particular direction. Now, when we were talking about how these courses can be affordable or how Green River can be affordable, um, you saw there the, the absolute numbers. And it is quite a shocking difference between Green River College and say, University of Michigan, something like that. It's like 20% the cost. Um, that's great for those first two years. The next two years, obviously, you would be paying probably the higher cost, but it does average down overall. And it does mean that you can kind of get an American university degree at an affordable level. If on the other hand, you decide actually the fees for the public universities in the US in that transfer when you move on are too expensive, um, there are possibilities for you to transfer back to Europe. Now, we showed you one of the examples from Goresh in that presentation. Uh, he's a British student we helped many years ago now. Uh, and he decided after doing his two years at Green River to go and study in the Netherlands. And he ended up paying, you know, like 2000 euro a year for his education in the Netherlands after, you know, so it was very cost effective. Um, what Green River College are doing is they are looking at expanding the number of partners they have here in the UK as well. And one of the ones that's not quite there just yet, but it's coming, is with the University of York, you know, a Russell Group University here. And basically what that means is, depending on what you were to do in the one or two years at Green River College, you could then transfer to York and go either into the second or the third year, depending on precisely what you want to do. And then you'd be treated back here. I can't imagine it would be any different from any regular British student with access to tuition fee loans and maintenance loans and so on. So, you know, you might find that this is a great way to get that kind of American experience um, without, you know, racking up a huge, huge bill over time. Um, beyond that, one of the other things that we haven't mentioned at all right now, uh, which quite honestly is being seen as a, a much more of a threat than it is a, uh, a, a good thing, let's put it that way, um, coronavirus. Uh, I am going to mention it. Obviously, we're talking mostly about 2021. Uh, for those of you on this call today, um, we would be hoping that by then things have gotten back to a version of normal if that's a new normal or whatever, it will mean you'll be living on campus, being taught on campus rather than through sessions like this. Um, but the fact of the matter is every university in the world is improving its blended or online provision, which does actually create a possibility potentially to do some of the classes here in the UK, keeping down the living costs a little bit before moving over to the US and so on, or vice versa. So there's a lot more flexibility that uh, online education might offer, particularly around these general classes early in the beginning of a degree. But anyway, um, that's pretty much what I wanted to point out to you in terms of what the opportunity actually involves. But really what I'd like to do now is to throw this session over to you guys to answer any questions that you might have. Now I can see that we've got a couple in the Q&A already. We're going to go to those right now, but please do write anything. I haven't seen these yet. Um, and please do go through them uh, and put your questions into the Q&A and we'll just work our way down from the top. Um, the first question, that the first question there, or well, the second question on the screen, if you can see it, yellow, is one I kind of started off by addressing a little bit right now. Um, yeah. and, and that is the whole thing that, well, in total, students would be staying in Green River for two years, then transfer to another university to finish their studies. That's so if you if you would express it in, in very, very simple numbers, um, let's say Green River College tuition is 10,000, right? And your ideal school would be Washington State University, which is 40,000. Easy numbers. 40,000 times four, because the bachelor's degree would be four years, is 120,000, uh, 160,000 you would be spending. If the first two years you're only paying, you know, our tuition fee, which is ten thousand, you only spent the forty thousand for the final two years, which would bring the total up to a hundred thousand, which is sixty thousand dollars less uh, than you would have otherwise, and therefore it's a much more affordable option to definitely fifty percent or forty nine percent actually of uh, U.S. citizens start off at a college themselves before going to university. 
And that's not taking into consideration the part of the US population that doesn't go to university, which is also very significant. So um, the ones that actually go directly to universities is, is an, it's neglectable because they can't afford it usually. Yeah, this is something that's often not understood by uh, international candidates. It's that the four year college experience, if you like, is certainly not the norm. It's one of several norms, let's put it that way, when it comes to engaging with the US. So the idea of doing two years somewhere or transferring in general, transfer is really quite common in the US in general, far more than it is in the UK, where you're much more likely to start a degree and finish it in the same place. Moving around, taking time out, experiencing new things, these are absolutely parts of it but yeah definitely the cost will be determined by the university you go to rather than by what the green river fees are uh, you know once you leave green river you'll be paying a different amount of money that much is inevitable you might be able to access scholarships at that point you might also find you're able to access better quality of universities there is actually a lot of research out there that shows that students have done two years in community colleges when they transfer the school that they transfer into often might have been one that has rejected them first time round. So, you know, it can be a way of, you know, trading up, if you like, in some respects. Um, I'm going to start from, the, well, I'm going to start, the next question I'm going to answer is one from the top. Um, this one will obviously be only of, of relevance to a certain number of people. How would signing up work for someone who lives in the UK but actually has a US passport? In some respects, it's going to be easier around your visa, around access to finance as well. You should be able to access federal aid. Uh, the application process, I don't honestly think it's going to be any different. I don't think the entry requirements would be any lower, although for Green River, they are pretty modest anyway. Um, but, you know, financially speaking, you would be at an advantage. I, I don't know, Yella, do you have anything you'd... Uh, financially speaking, definitely you're correct on that one, on the advantage. The only thing, uh, what I would consider being a disadvantage is having a U.S. passport is you will be seen as a U.S. citizen, um, which also means you will not be processed as an international student and therefore you won't, um, you know, participate in the International Orientation Week uh, and you won't get all the international assistance that we have for some others, at least not the official um, or should I say that the the official week? On top of that, uh, of course, our international office is willing to assist you however they can. Um, but we can just not register you for international classes right off the, the first week of school. That's the only breakdown because you are a U.S. citizen, even though you're probably not really because you probably never lived uh, there. That's the only only downside. But financially, it's a it's a much better fit. It's a lot cheaper. Right. Um, more information about the living costs. Does it include food? Um, I'm going to imagine, yes, the living costs will include food. Um, yeah, the accommodation will be self-catered. The one thing I will say about the living costs that Yella put up on that slide, um, the one thing that I thought wasn't mentioned, which probably should be, uh, health insurance. And the cost of that can sometimes be quite considerable. At Green River, it's included in the tuition fee. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. So that's you an have absolute bargain. That, pretty, that is because that pretty. Be um, we can deduct it. Like if you're not interested in it, you can have your own health insurance, but you only get about three hundred dollars back. And the health insurance is very high quality. So I wouldn't advise going anywhere else. Stay at the college. If that's the case, and uh, yeah, that's my ignorance for not knowing that. Uh, no that's actually a bargain. Um, if you were going anywhere else, and health insurance is not bundled with it you can be looking at $1,500 a year as additional cost. Yeah. And again, with COVID, who knows, this could be much higher. A lot of these insurance packages are, are being changed. Um, but yeah, if, assuming the health insurance is covered within the fees and all the rest of it, then I think that's absolutely, let's put it this way, $21,000 a year. Um, you will be spending that, if not more, just by going to university in the UK. The key difference, of course, is that you'll have to have your own money to pay for it in the US, whereas here you can get loans. But if you were in a fortunate position of being, a, you know, thinking about, I've got this much money for my education in the UK or abroad, then you might find that the US actually is comparable in terms of the cost. So hopefully that answers that question. And it's certainly yeah, on top, of the, on top of the cost as well, um, it showed you about $9,000. That is an estimate depending on where you live and how, you know, what your living standard is. For example, with host families, uh, meals are included. Um, living on your own in, in the dorm, uh, you have to 
you know, cook for yourself. So meals are excluded. Um, generally speaking, living on campus is a little bit more expensive than living with our family. So whatever you choose, regardless of what you choose, I think the host family would probably end up being around 8,000 for the full year and living on your own, maybe 9,000, 10,000, 9,000, 10,000, somewhere in that range. Um, but it's, it's an estimate and we see that most international students have, they see it as a good, you know, a good fit. Right. The next question that we've got is asking, are there any apprenticeship degrees in the USA? Now, this is kind of a strange area. Apprenticeship degrees obviously are very, very much connected with, you know, workplace and getting actual real world experience. And while you can get work experience, I'm pretty much sure as part of any uh, program at a US university, I don't, apprenticeship degrees in most countries where they do exist do tend to be geared more towards the, uh, the local market, if you like. So I don't think you'd find many international apprenticeship uh, programs. I, I have seen a few programs that are, probably what you're asking for um, in Canada. So uh, there are colleges in Canada where they do have like apprenticeship type programs, which are very much geared towards uh, the workplace. I'm not really sure if there's anything of that nature in the US, anything of that nature at Green River College? Uh, not that I'm aware of at the moment. Um, yeah, no, my knowledge is I slacking think, there. Okay, I think in most countries, apprenticeships are generally designed for the local population rather than the international student body. The one real exception I'd say to that would be Canada um, and Australia. They have things called TAFEs, which are further education colleges. Maybe you could find something of that nature there. But I think in the US, because it's so tied up with student visas and things like that, uh, or like post-study work visas, it could be problematic. <laughs> the next what's question, the weather like? what's the weather like in Seattle? Where should we get all the time? <laughs> Well, it's, um, if you compare it to the UK, it's better. I would personally say I grew up in the Netherlands. Uh, we're all used to a lot of rain. Um, whereas in Seattle, yeah, it does rain. Um, the summer's gorgeous. And then I'm talking about, you know, 30 degrees Celsius, four or five months in a row, almost no rain. Fall and spring could be a bit rainy. Winter could be a bit snowy. Um, if you look up, oh my God, it rains a lot. There's actually more rain in New York than there is in Seattle. So that should not be one of the reasons why you choose one or the other. Um, personally, it didn't bug me. And if you're from the UK, I don't think you'll see it as an issue. The one time I've been to Seattle, um, I got on a plane in London where it was, this was in May, it was 13 degrees and raining. I got off the plane in Seattle like 11 hours later, it was 13 degrees and raining. So <laughs> it's the one time I got halfway around the world to exactly the same weather. It is wet. Uh, but nothing that's going to freak you out. And it's not wet every day, as the other points out. That's a massive association that people sometimes have with Seattle, which I don't think is, strictly speaking, always true. Now, we've got a couple of people asking this next question, um, ACTs and SATs. Um, I've actually, we've got more than that. And I'm actually going to read out a question you know, it's a little bit further down because this kind of gets to the nub of what I want to say about this. With COVID-19, some universities are becoming test optional for SAT and ACT. Should we expect them to still take these standardized tests in the UK for 2021? Well, let's cover the Green River College story first, and then I'll move on to a more general explanation. So from a Green River admissions point of view, Yella, what do the SATs and the ACTs mean? Nothing. Nothing. Exactly. Nope. Don't we're, an open we're an open institution, so um, unless... I mean, you have to be over 16, have to be proficient in English. We accept every student, um, of course, to enroll in academic classes. We have a placement test, which will test your English level and your math level. And based on that test, we will put you in either, uh, um, you know, the lowest math class or the highest math class will, regardless. Um, but no SATs or ACTs required. Right. This is quite common for most colleges, community colleges, if you like, in the US. So the, this, one of the other, if you like, kind of unseen benefits of the transfer idea of doing two years at Green River and then moving on to do your two years at UCLA or Brown or whatever, is the fact that you don't have to do the SATs to get in. It's not even a fact at all, not even look at them. But there is a broader question there that was asked, the one I started off about with the SATs and the ACTs, which is certainly if you're following what's going on in the USA right now, you are hopefully aware that a lot of universities are now, be, and, and prestigious universities, in fact, seven of the eight Ivy Leagues are included in this, 
are now becoming what's called test optional, which means that you don't have to have SATs or ACTs to apply there, and they will consider you without them. If you have those scores, they will look at them, but they're not compulsory. Some universities are actually going further than that. In California, the University of California system, which is schools like UC Berkeley, UCLA, they've actually gone so far as to say that within the next five years, they will stop looking at SATs, ACTs at all. Okay, So these really will become totally irrelevant. Now, they have said that they might come up with their own test to replace that, uh, but nobody knows what that test is. And I presume it's going to have exactly the same weaknesses as the SAT and the ACT anyway. So I think it's highly likely that these universities will end up uh, being test optional, test free at some point in the future. So COVID-19 is having two effects on the SATs and ACTs. Number one, you simply can't take these things because the test centers are just aren't available. And number two, a lot of universities are actually using this moment to think, actually, what do these tests actually deliver for us? Because honestly, the SAT will tell me more about how much money your parents have got than how bright you are. It's a test that doesn't really test anything that's useful for college admission. So they're kind of the bane of my life. I don't really agree with SATs and ACTs, and you might be getting a little bit of uh, bias from me there. I'm free to, free to admit that. Um, but I think they're going to become less uh, significant um, as time goes on. Um, um, so, but for the time being, you know, the advice I'd usually give people is if you're looking at applying to the USA, you're usually going to have, I don't know, five, six universities that you might be applying to, same as you would do in the UK with your five choices through UCAS. In the past, I would have said without doubt, the majority of those would require an SAT or an ACT. I think in the future, it might be that only one or two of them will require those tests. So in this day and age, you get a lot of people say, I'm going to apply to NYU because it's test optional. Well, you can now apply to Harvard because it's test optional, UCLA because it's test optional. That's just going to become a lot more common. So I think, you know, yeah, we'll have to watch this space and see what happens. But I do know specifically the SAT is, um, <coughs> I don't want to say on borrowed time, but the reality is it's, it's, uh, its significance is changing. So keep, keep an eye on that. Okay. Um, now let's see. We've got a few more questions. I'm just trying to see which is the best one to come. Actually, I'm going to go to the second one down there, Yella, because this is absolutely one for you. Would you About the brothers, correct? Or with a host family? Um, that is not the second one, Dan. That's okay. up for it's me. It's my second question. Sorry, there. Um, got you right. Yeah. Well, that all comes down to your personal preference. What kind of person are you? Are you very outgoing, or do you like you know things a little bit? or quietly, um, would you rather have a cultural experience or more of a student experience? Um, is it the first time you're gonna live on your own? Have you ever you know, made dinner yourself or would you like to be assisted with that in the host families? Uh, so there are several, you know, several options and everything it comes down to your, again, your personal preference. Uh, I would say um, because Green River arranges their own, we have our own in-house uh, housing department, meaning that we can shift quite easily between accommodations. So if you want to live on campus for three months or six or whatever, or start off with the host family, we can change that throughout the year. And therefore we're very flexible and give you the opportunity to experience both at the same time. Um, concluded, if you're a UK citizen have ne has never lived on their own, I would advise start off with the host family for three months, have you know that soft landing into the US, learn more about the culture, meet other people, your host family will tell you about the area, and after three months you move on to the on-campus apartments on your own and be the real American student. Right. Um, the next question I want to look at, sorry, there's a few that kind of I'm going to group together, but this next one is out there by itself. It is something you touched on earlier, Yale. Uh, once the degree is completed, where does it say it came from? Both colleges? The university. And universities. The it's university. Of the university, yeah? Yeah, your degree would just say Bachelor of Business, University of whatever it might be. Um, and that's, that's still a sort of a stigma people have, like going to college, lesser degree, not a good thing, cheap, it doesn't qualify. No one will ever, your degree would stay exactly the same as somebody who paid $60,000 more. Yeah. 
So I bet you would have an associate's degree from Green River College and then yeah. a bachelor's degree from correct. Washington. So you have basically um, two degrees. Yeah, that's correct. Um, say, for example, you were to use the, the the pathway I mentioned earlier of York University here in the UK, you would end up actually, I guess, after three, possibly after four years, with a an associate's degree from Green River College and a bachelor's degree from a UK university. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, really, you're getting exactly the same as if you'd been there the whole time. You've just got this added bonus of uh, an associate's degree along the line as well there. Um, um, what, what people sometimes forget about, I personally experienced that as a student. You say, why would you go to the U.S.? Uh, it's a lot of money for school. Uh, education in the Netherlands is amazing itself. Why spend all, you know, those questions? Um, it's the experience on top of that living abroad and having that as a, you know, personal experience is very good. looks very good on your resume. It's a great personal experience. You make friends all over the world. And, and that's what can't be expressed in, in financial cost, but it's definitely worth considering in my opinion. Right. Um, while we're on the sort of subject of transfers, and I guess this is playing into the same fear or interest can you transfer to an ivy league after the two years do you want to answer or shall i yeah i mean i'll answer and say it happens do you have specific examples i don't think it's ever happened for harvard but i do believe that brown and princeton or places like that it has happened we have it, it has happened definitely we have students that we've sent to ivy league schools um, but again, we have university transfer pathways, schools where we can guarantee acceptance. Ivy League schools are usually not one of our pathways because they get so many applicants, they don't care, basically. Yeah. Um, but it, it has happened, definitely. It just depends on what kind of student you are, how your grades are, how your application is, everything. Absolutely. I mean, there's, nobody's going to give you a guarantee that you go to Green River, you're going to walk into Harvard two years later. It's just, it's not possible. I mean, we do, we have found that people who've been, if you like, rejected first time round can improve their chances after two years, at, uh, you know, at a US college. You're less of a risk, if you like, because you know a lot more about the US system. But there's absolutely nobody in the world who's going to guarantee you, guarantee you that outcome. It's just not possible. Right. Um, I just want to, well, I'm just trying to sort these out. Um, Sorry, I've done that one. I'm just wading through a whole load of similar but different questions. I mean, one, just to get back to the, the Ivy League, one yeah. of the examples in the presentation was Remco, and he's doing his PhD at Yale right at the moment. Started off at Green River. Um, so that is one of the examples that you can definitely excel. Maybe not right away, but you can excel throughout your academic career. Right. Um, I'm just going to ask, I'm going to go on to a couple of Green River specific ones and then we're going to return yeah, to sure. financial aid and scholarships because this seems to be coming up time and again. Um, are there opportunities to work during your time at Green River and at universities in general? Um, yes. Yes. Um, I'm going to start with the overall picture and then and yeah, I can perhaps give it from a Green River point of view. Um, on a student visa in the US, um, your work opportunities are limited usually to work on campus. Now, that means you can't just go off and find any old job, but it does mean that a lot of universities, um, when they're awarding jobs or handing them out, will hand them out to international students, perhaps preferentially to American students. It can also be on occasion that part of the overall financial aid picture, if you like, is you'll get a scholarship, but we'll also give you some you know, pocket money related to working, et cetera. But the idea that you could just rock up in America at a university there and just go off and work wherever you felt like it as much as you wanted, uh, no, there are rules against that. Um, does that tally with what you would say, Yala? Yeah, I mean, on your visa, you're allowed to work up to 20 hours a week, it has to be on camp, or you have to work for the college, but that doesn't mean it has to be on campus, meaning um, I had a job at Green River, and I was hired as a photographer. And they basically asked me to take photos all over the, you know, over the state for, you know, fun experience, a thing to share with the students on social media, how fun Washington State is. For example, I was out hiking, take photos, share that with the world. I got paid for that. So I, my job was the best job I had. Um, but indeed, the options are limited. Um, although usually students do get paid 
I mean, I don't know the UK perspective, but on, on average, it's about $12, $13 an hour. Um, so it's, it's decent money. It's about 800 bucks a, a month, a, yeah, a month, which would pay for your student housing, for example, and therefore it's much more affordable uh, to study in the US. So that could be done for a certain amount of students, perhaps not for everybody, but you know, there we are- We cannot guarantee, no. We cannot there. guarantee jobs. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the next question, which is again, another specific Green River one. Could you do a gap year before attending Green River? Well, this is quite an interesting one because actually you, you could count your gap year towards the two years, couldn't you? The credits that you right. earn as part of the gap that, year. I mean, great. you can take, uh, as a gap year, if you come to Green River as a gap year student, we allow you to take classes however you like. So if you want to study biology with maths, with uh, sports, and welding, sure, be my guest, go ahead. That is allowed during your gap year. If you want to have the gap year counted to your, your one, one of the two years at Green River, you might want to pick your classes a little bit, you know, a little bit better uh, and take into consideration that you might want to extend your time at Green River. So there are some uh, general education classes that are mandatory, choose one of those. But yes, you could do both options either a free gap year and then start to your general studies or do a gap year where you work on your general education already and count as your first year of the second of the two years at Green River. So yeah, you have freedom to do that, um, whichever way you want, but just be aware there are consequences of choosing one way over, over another. Um, right, um, just looking here, I have both a German and a US passport, so I applied with my German passport. What would happen then? Um, well, I think it depends on the... You're going to be paying the same fees, let's put it that way. Um, your access to funding as a US student, as a US passport holder, is greater than it is as a German. But Yellow also pointed out there, there is the downside, particularly at Green River College, where you would be, if you like, excluded from the to a certain extent from the international environment. Um, but it wouldn't... I can't imagine it would have any negative consequences going with one or the other, but my tendency in that circumstance would always be to use a US passport, I would say. So would I. Okay. All right. Well, that neatly answers that one. Um, how does applying for a visa for uni in the USA work? Now, this is an area where I'm going to describe myself as not an expert at all. I don't get involved in visas at all. I'm sure that Yella doesn't either, but he will have been through the experience once upon a time. How was it? Um, how it works, uh, you file your application, and in this case, that was to Green River. Um, we review the application, see if all the documents are correct, and then we issue an I-20. It's an official document which says to the US government that whatever the name is, we'll study at Green River, and, and we will host a student here, and you know, a lot of official and legal um, text, and then with the I-20, you can make an, an appointment at the US Embassy in the UK. They'll review it, uh, invite you for an appointment. You'll have to present what your plan is in the US, and that way uh, you get your visa. The process in total, depending on how busy time of the year is, is usually about, from application to obtaining your visa is about six, seven weeks, I would say. Uh, so start on time and don't do this last minute. Okay, thank you very much. But yeah, I mean, I think visas for British citizens going to study in the USA are relatively straightforward and simple. I mean, obviously, if you've got a criminal record or something, that's going to maybe slow things down. But uh, generally speaking, you should and be okay. On, on top of that, all, the only thing they check or the, the thing they worry about the most is students that go to the US to study and never go back. Right. The US is very welcoming to European or UK citizens or whatever to study in the US and then just return to their home country. Um, but that's the only thing they basically test during the interview. Are you willing to go back once you graduate? Yes or no? So the answer to that question is always yes, I intend to go back to England as soon as I'm finished. So correct. <laughs> don't, don't go on about how you want to live there for, for the rest of your life. Um, no. You might end up doing that, but they don't like to hear it. Um, okay. Now, We've got one more question and I'm just going to go through before then we bump it. We've got a whole bunch of stuff about scholarships. Um, the one other one that we've got before that is about the process of expand, uh, applying to study medicine in the USA. 
Um, Yella and I were talking about this before we got online with the rest of you. Um, basically, uh, don't study medicine in the USA is pretty much the advice I've got to give you here. Um, medical, uh, medical schools are graduate schools, which means you can't straight out of school apply to go to medical school. You have to have a relevant scientific bachelor's degree first which in a U.S. context means you would go to a U.S. university and your major would usually be what's called pre-med, preparation for medicine. Uh, after that, you then apply for med school. And after four years of that, you do two years of residency. Ten years after you started your education, you're a qualified doctor in the USA. The expense involved in doing that is enormous. The chances of you being able to do it as an international student are very, very low indeed. Um, so you know, getting into medical school is, is extremely tough. Getting into medical school in the US after having done a bachelor's degree in the UK, for example, or something like that, it happens, but very, very rarely. So you kind of do need to do your bachelor's degree in the US if you want to go down this route. You are talking at med school fees of $76,000 a year, something like that. So it's expensive. And then when you graduate, the first thing they're going to do is give you 30 days to get out of the country. So Basically, you can qualify there, you can rack up a huge amount of debt. Will you be able to stay on and work there? I can't give you that guarantee. Nobody can. Obviously, as a doctor, you are far better, you know, qualified than many, many other people to actually meet, you know, requirements to get a visa or something like that. But it's not automatic. What we what I often say to people who want to be doctors in the USA is don't qualify in the USA, but look for somewhere in Europe or elsewhere, where you can actually take uh, a degree that prepares you for the US MLE, the US Medical Licensing Exam. There are two parts to that. One part of that can be done after four years of med school in Europe. Uh, there's a couple of Italian schools, uh, Irish, Polish ones that I'm aware that do this. The second part has to be done in the US, I believe. Um, but you can qualify to become a doctor in the US. But the idea that you would go to university and then on to med school, well, if you've got a spare half a million dollars knocking around, go for it. But, you know, if you want to work in the NHS, you've just bankrupted yourself. So it's a difficult, one, a different balance to strike. Anyway, the remaining, sorry, I, th I thought we had three questions left, but we actually have five now more. There's um, two short ones additional on the, the visa cost, roughly, uh, let's say in the range of, of three to five hundred. Three to five hundred dollars, yeah. In that range, yeah. Sports teams are there. At the moment, Green River has for men's uh, baseball, basketball, cross country, and track and field. Women's is basketball, cross country, soccer, track and field, and volleyball. Um, Green River is looking at options to extend soccer for men as well, as that's you know pretty popular among a lot of people here. Uh, but those are the sports we have at the moment, and you can find them on the link. More information, I'll share that in the. Uh, chat box right now with all the athletics. Okay. Good stuff. Which brings us to our final three questions, which are all connected with money, surprise, surprise, and scholarships. Um, the first one is, are there scholarships out there for a US citizen living in the UK? And specifically because you're a US citizen living in the UK, nobody's going to care. Okay. In fact, um, there aren't going to be scholarships for you because you're an American living in the UK. Could you apply for scholarships? Um, sure. Why not? Um, what I would say is, in actual fact, the, the key financial difference for you as a U.S. citizen over an international student is not scholarships, but loans. It's access to federal aid and things like that. So as a U.S. citizen, you should be able to get loans to cover your tuition, some of your maintenance costs while you're in the States. But you need to research into that. But by and large, you're going to be charged the same fees as you would be as an international student. Uh, the scholarships are... you. Well, Occasionally they're geographic specific, but there's very few scholarships just for for British people uh, or for uh, I'm not aware of any for Americans living in the UK uh, specifically. Um, so that kind of addresses that one. Um, the next two questions we've got around financial aid are both. Well, I'll read out the second one. The first one's got a bit too much personal detail in it. Um, some universities are very generous with financial aid. However, from what I know, they tend to be the most prestigious. Are there real options for a large amount of financial help from institutions or through private scholarships with universities with higher acceptance rates? Um, you've kind of put your finger on the, the button with this one. Why is it that they have lower acceptance rates? It's because more people apply. Why do more people apply? Because they are more generous with financial aid. So we do honestly come across people who look at which colleges in the USA 
are what's called need blind and would offer you as much money as they believe you need to go and study there. For international students, that's literally only six or seven universities these days. And it does include Harvard, Yale, Princeton, MIT, places like that. They get a huge amount of applications because they are generous for the students that they want. How many of the students do they want out of the numbers that apply? A very, very small number. They only ever accept somewhere around two and a half percent of international students. Uh, Stanford that rate is from, the others might be a little bit higher. Stanford's usually the hardest. Um, and not, those students are not all going to be getting scholarships. So naturally enough, yes, you want to be looking at other universities and other places that might have financial aid, but then it tends to become not based purely on your financial circumstances so much as it is based on what you have to offer a university. And here universities can be a little bit surprising. You can find there are some uh, lesser known universities that do have um, more generous financial aid for people who are getting straight A's who would not ordinarily otherwise consider them. Um, basically what I mean by that, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that the question as to whether or not you're going to get a scholarship is not really one about whether a university has money available. It's more about what have you got to offer a university. Um, we always encourage people when they're going to start off on this route of trying to get a scholarship, rather than thinking in terms of, um, you know, which university's got money, because how relevant is that, to be honest? If you find a university that's got money, but it's hopeless for you, why? Why would you go there just because they're giving you money? Far better instead to think um, about what you've got to offer universities and then try and find a university that might actually care about that thing. I'm talking not just about sporting ability, you know, some sp universities will have full scholarships for some certain sports, but not for others. Um, I'm talking about things like it might be, um, you know, um, musical ability, theatre, something like that. Um, and you can't you can't have you know so you might find there are people who are yeah sorry there we go um you've got you might find there are people who have got to um you know just um you know who've got talents that could effectively um you know you know could those those talents could be rewarded by a university that cares about these things so it's not as straight it's not always about sporting ability or something like that could literally be musical could be any number of things uh, that, that might get you a scholarship some places you know there might be essay writing competitions you can enter that might give you money off but the one thing i will say about scholarships and financial aid in general is people do get fixated on these free rides these 100 percent awards they are extremely rare you're far more likely to get a scholarship that's going to be um, you know, for a proportion of the costs. And I haven't even touched on the most common form of scholarships at all right now, which are for academic ability. You know, the better your grades are, the chances are you'll get a discount on the fees that can be sometimes quite sizable. The first number that you see quoted on an, Amer on an American university website in terms of what the fees are is not often what you would, well, I mean, it's not always what you would end up paying. I mean, sometimes you can get quite significant discounts on that. The one final point I will make on scholarships and financial aid and all the rest of it is that unless you're searching out a route like Green River, which is very cost effective, you're unlikely to find a, um, a, a scholarship that makes the cost lower than studying in the UK. It's, you know, you can bring the cost down from really, really, really expensive to expensive, but bringing it down to cheaper than studying in the UK or free, just not going to happen. Just very, very rare. I want to add to that, Mark, Mark if I can. Um, a lot of schools promote with scholarships for international students, um, but I personally don't really think it's worth it. For example, schools that cost $45,000 a year say we offer $20,000 scholarships for international students, where you know $20,000 sounds like a lot of money, but you'll still be paying $25,000 a year. So I think everybody should really win looking into scholarships and when schools offer it, look at the bottom, you know, what's at the bottom of the page and what's the amount you're actually gonna have to pay yourself. Uh, and I just think I get $20,000 for free. You still have to pay a significant amount yourself. Right. We have no questions left. So if there was something out there that you're really determined to ask us, um, speak up now because we have about 90 seconds, I suppose, before I'm gonna uh, pull the plug on this because we are now at the end of our hour. No okay, questions. no more questions coming in uh, briefly. So I'm going to actually oh. pull, 
Well, sorry, it it won't come in just as you speak. Is it true that you pay termly? Could be, depending. You can pay all at once, you can pay per month, you can pay per quarter, whatever works for you. Okay, so that one's addressed. Anything else? Looks like that was it. Okay, well, I'm going to say you had your chance. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Yella, for your contribution to this as well. Uh, hopefully, that's given you a little bit more information to go about your research into the US. We will be posting this online uh, on YouTube at some point. So, you know, if you've got quest, if you want to refer back to anything we've mentioned, uh, by all means, you can do that. We'll send you out a link to the presentation, plus some of the details that Yell has put into the chat box there, and a few other things that we can maybe do to help you. But thanks very much um, for joining us. And um, yeah, great. That was all. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.